Hello and welcome to this tutorial on electrical impedance and AC. As we begin it's worth noting that many piezoelectric devices have complex electrical properties and familiarity with RF impedance assists the understanding of these devices. We'll begin by looking at Ohm's law which expresses the relationship between impedance, voltage and current and all of these quantities can be complex valued. To illustrate this, consider how we can separate impedance into a purely real component, the resistance, and a purely imaginary component, the reactance. Another useful quantity is admittance, which is defined as the reciprocal of impedance. Once again, we can separate this into a real component, the conductance, and an imaginary component, the susceptance. Let's now look at how we might combine components. Consider here a series circuit consisting of Z1 and Z2 in series. If we wish it to represent this two component series circuit as a single equivalent impedance, we would find that Zt is simply the arithmetic sum of Z1 and Z2. Therefore, when we're looking at series combinations, the use of impedance is the most effective way of combining these components' values. Let's now look at a parallel circuit where we have Z1 and Z2, but this time connected in parallel. Again, looking to derive an equivalent impedance, Zt, we note that the relationship between the two is a purely reciprocal one, so that 1 over Zt is 1 over Z1 plus 1 over Z2, and so on if additional components were needed. This is more conveniently expressed in terms of those admittances. So here we can see that yt is y1 plus y2. And so for that reason, when we're looking at parallel combinations of components, it's often more convenient to use an admittance description of them. Within this tutorial, we'll consider the behavior of a number of components at AC, and we'll start by looking at the ideal capacitor. For this purpose, we'll start by considering its DC response before we go to look at what happens when it's presented with an alternating current. So the capacitor has got two electrode plates that are separated by an insulating spacer. Here, the dielectric constant, or relative permittivity, epsilon r, is shown. And we'll consider a static voltage applied across the capacitor. When a voltage is applied, there'll be a tendency for a current to flow. But because of the insulating nature of the spacer, no current flows across the capacitor. Note here that as charge flows into the device, and here we're considering current as occurring first, we get a response within the dielectric as an E-field is set up. And in this situation, we notice that current was first, and then the electric field within the capacitor was second. If we know what the separation of the plates are and their area, we can calculate the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor as shown. Let's look in a little more detail at that charging and discharging behavior. So we'll start off by considering the applied voltage and then the capacitor as shown. V in is the applied voltage and VC is the voltage that develops across the plates of cap the capacitor. If we look here at an applied voltage, which undertakes a step profile, we will see that the corresponding voltage across the plates of the capacitor initially charges, and then if we change the circuit so that we can discharge through some form of resistance, we will then discharge the plates of the capacitor. But what happens if our applied input voltage changes more rapidly than the charge and discharge time of the capacitor-resistor combination? In this case, 
the voltage across the capacitor never quite reaches zero. And therefore, the response to AC is that the voltage across the capacitor is non-zero. In fact, if we look at the ratio of voltage to current from our definition of impedance, we find that the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c. So that as omega increases, the net effect for the impedance of the capacitor is to decrease. Now let us consider the behaviour of an inductor. In its simplest sense, an inductor is just a coil of wire with a current flowing through it. But in practice, this coil is often wrapped around some former. Often, this could be a rod or could be a toroid. Here we're looking at a rod former with a permeability mu r. As a current flows into the coil, a magnetic field is generated within the coil. However, there is a back EMF, epsilon, that is generated that attempts to resist the flow of this current. If we know the number of turns, n, we have the permeability of free space, mu naught, and the relative permeability of the former material, and we know the cross-sectional area of each loop, and the current, we can calculate the inductance. Notice that this back EMF has got a DIDT term in there. So if the current is changing rapidly, as you would experience at high frequency, there will be greater back EMF, and therefore greater opposition to the flow of current through the inductor. And for this reason, we find that the impedance of an inductor, ZL, increases as frequency increases. As with the case of the capacitor, note that the impedance of an inductor is purely imaginary. To assist us to remember how the phase in reactive components behaves, the word civil is a useful aid memoir. Because here we note that in a capacitor, current is 90 degrees ahead of voltage. I leads V. Whereas in an inductor, voltage is 90 degrees ahead of current. V is before I. Now let us consider what happens in an ideal transformer. Here we'll have six turns on the primary side and four turns on the secondary side. In much the same way we saw with our inductor, if a current flows into the transformer, magnetic field lines will be generated. Here we note that the magnetic flux is coupled in via six turns on the primary side, but only coupled out to a current again by four turns on the secondary side. And therefore, the secondary current has to be six over four, or one and a half times greater than the primary side current. In fact, if we express that purely in terms of number of turns on the primary and secondary side, we find we have the product of number of turns and current being the same on both sides. But we also know from conservation of energy that the product of voltage and current must be constant on both sides. And therefore, we could rearrange our equation to express the voltage on the primary and voltage on the secondary side in terms of the number of turns on primary and secondary. Now this is particularly useful when we look at impedance. Recall that on the primary side, the impedance is given by the voltage over the current, and that the product of number of turns and current is the same on both sides, which we've then used in the context of our voltage equations as well. And if we combine these two equations, we find that the impedance on the secondary side is related to the square of the turns ratio on the primary side. Now it's also important to realize that thus far we've only talked about ideal components.
real components will be somewhat more complex. Consider here a simple axial round inductor. This we would normally expect to represent with a single inductance as a circuit symbol. However, because the coils are made of thin wire, there will be a resistance associated with those. And because the coils will not want to short one to another, they're normally covered with some kind of insulating spacer. And this gives rise to an interwinding capacitance. And so the equivalent circuit of this simple axial inductor is actually an RL series circuit with a capacitor in parallel. Let's now consider what happens for the basic voltage divider. Here we have two resistances, R1 and R2, and a current that flows around this circuit. Now, we note that Ohm's law applies for both of the resistors. But we could also combine the two resistors into an equivalent circuit, or an equivalent resistance of R1 plus R2, in which case we could apply Ohm's law to that equivalent circuit. So our input voltage is simply our current multiplied by the sum of R1 R2. We can rearrange Ohm's law for R2 to give us just the current. And combining the two together allows us to find that the voltage across R2 is simply the input voltage multiplied by R2 over the sum of R1 plus R2. Let's now see how we can combine the voltage divider that we saw previously with the impedance of reactive components to give us a filter circuit. We'll begin by looking at a low pass filter, which comprises a resistor and a capacitor. Recall that the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C, and therefore the voltage developed across that capacitor in this circuit is related to the input voltage by the fractional term Zc over R plus Zc. Let's now look at the voltage across the capacitor as a function of frequency. At low frequency, Zc is much larger than the resistance, R, and therefore the fractional term tends to towards 1. And as such, V in is almost Vc, and we end up with a high output value. As frequency increases, the impedance of the capacitor decreases. And in this situation, R starts to become a more dominant term, in which case we get a significant reduction in the output voltage across Vc. And if we sweep through frequency, we find that we end up with a curve looking much like this. If we swap the order of the capacitor and the resistor, we can apply exactly the same logic. And we now find that the voltage across the resistor relates to R over R plus Zc. In this case, we note that at low frequency, Zc is a very large value, in which case we get quite a small output voltage across the resistor. But as frequency goes up, Zc becomes much smaller until eventually you end up with a very high output value of Vr equivalent to Vin. And this is our typical response curve here. Thus far, we've considered low and high pass filters only. But what if we wish to pass or stop signals with frequencies that are only within a certain range? We'll start by considering a voltage and a resistor with a capacitor in parallel. From what we've seen previously, we know that the output voltage will give us a low pass filter. However, by putting an additional parallel inductor, we provide an alternative path, an alternative voltage divider. And this would be a high pass filter. In this situation, it is only the signal that is 
to the right of the red curve and to the left of the blue curve, which will be passed. We have a band pass filter. By changing the values of R, L and C, we can change the frequencies at which their respective roll-offs occur. And by doing this, we could separate the low-pass and high-pass responses, so that in this situation, we would have a band stop, sometimes referred to as a notch filter. So to summarise then, we've seen that even simple components and circuits behave very differently at radio frequency, and that there's no such thing as an ideal component. We hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you have, please come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial video series.